Today on the Hopefield Financial Podcast, I'm going to start by telling a story about how I had to have a written agreement to carpool with my brother. Our budget tip is going to help make sure that your budget meetings happen every month. Our listener question today asks if there's ever such a thing as good financial enabling. And for our main topic today, we're going to be going through a nerd wallet article about borrowing money from family. Good morning and welcome to the Hopefeld Financial Podcast. My name is Jay Disberger, your one and only Hopefeld Financial Coach, and I'm happy that you're here with us today. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you could probably tell that I'm a type A or type A plus personality who is extremely detailed and unlikely to be late. I take things relatively seriously. Now, my brothers are all very different from me. Not to say that oh, I'm more likely to be on time and others aren't. But certain personalities predispose themselves to a propensity to being on time or early, while others are are less likely to be so. And while I was in college, I carpooled with one brother who will remain nameless for this story. So my brother was a little bit more laid back and less likely to be on time. We, however, carpooled together because he didn't want to drive to campus on his own. We, We were both living from home in order to save on room and board. That was a good arrangement. Now, I had a car, and I was driving us back and forth. He went through a few seasons where he didn't have a car. He had a Volkswagen Beetle once that ended up in an accident and wasn't drivable for a while. Anyway, he needed rides to school, and the biggest problem started to grow out of my class schedule. I did get to pick which classes I went to, but there were certain classes that I didn't have a choice in, one of which was an architectural history class, and that was like a 7 or 7.30 a.m. class. So I had to get up around 6, get ready, leave before 7 a.m. in order to make it to class on time. And the particular teacher who ran this class would lock the door the minute class was supposed to start. If you were not on time or early, you didn't get to participate in class. You didn't get to listen to lecture. You didn't get to find out what was going to be the subject matter for the next test. So it was very important to me to be on time for this early morning class. However, for my brother, it was not as important. He didn't have a class that early in the day, but he still needed a ride. And he had a harder time getting motivated to get up in the morning and get to the car in time for me to make it to class. It became a recurring theme. And even though I said that I was going to drive him to school, we were going to carpool and we were going to split the cost of gas. Well, that arrangement was putting me at risk for not making it to class on time. I remember going out to the car, being ready. I remember waking him up and saying, hey, we got to go. We got to go. We got to make sure that we go. And it would be time to go. Then it would be five minutes past time to go. Then 10 minutes past time to go. And if I didn't leave at that point, I I wasn't going to make it to class at all. So here I have a decision to make. Do I leave and make it to class or do I skip class and try to maintain a softer relationship with my brother? I concluded that I was the one who was doing him a favor by being the driver and using my car. So I made a request that I will drive you to school, but you have to conform to my schedule and you can't make me late. If you are not in the car ready to go by a certain time, I'm simply going to leave without you and you won't have a ride for me that morning. I ended up putting more into the agreement. I wrote about three pages of expectations as to what was or wasn't allowed in the car, like were you allowed to bring food into the car if you were running late and you wanted to eat breakfast. And I liked keeping a clean car, so I didn't want breakfast eaten in the car. And I didn't want him taking my car off campus if he needed the car throughout the middle of the day and it was going to interrupt my access to it. I may have been a little bit strict here, but I thought it was important to establish well-articulated boundaries so that the agreement could be understood and there would be evidence of what the agreement was. So now if I ever had to leave him behind, I could say, well, I wrote down that if you're not here by this time, I'm going to leave without you so that, that way I'm not late for class. And that was the deal. If you don't abide by your part of the deal and you don't make it to the car on time, then I don't owe you a ride that day. And you're going to have to figure out another way to get to class. Now, this was really challenging. My brother tested the limits of this agreement by basically not making it to the car a few times. And as a result, I left him behind more than once. But by making sure that I stuck to my boundaries and stuck to my word, he ended up learning to get up and be ready on time and take that agreement seriously, take my schedule seriously, and respect the boundaries that we had. 
Ultimately, in the end, I think I have a better relationship with my brother because we had these boundaries. I didn't ever hold it against him later that he would make me late to class because I had an out in that front. And he never held it against me for leaving early because I had written down that I would if he wasn't ready on time. I want you to remember this lesson when we get to the main topic. But for now, it's time for today's budget tip. In line with the theme of writing things down, today's budget tip is to write down on your calendar when you're going to have a budget meeting. This is especially important if you're married, but it's still applicable if you're single as well. If you write down when you're going to have the budget meeting on the calendar, you set an expectation for when that budget meeting is going to happen. You make sure that you don't schedule a conflict with your budget meeting, and if you do, you know to move it. You basically set yourself up emotionally with the expectation that you're going to be looking at the budget that day. You know that's the day you need to be prepared to make your budget. It's the day that you need to be prepared to review how last month went. It sets up an expectation, a mutual expectation when you're married and you both know when that budget meeting is going to happen, you're much less likely to miss it or push it off. You're also less likely to say, oh, I don't want to do it now. I'm a little tired. You put it on the calendar. You made a plan. You made an agreement. You set a boundary for yourself. Now you stick to it to make sure it happens. And this works for more than just budget meetings. Anything that's written down in a mutually accessible place that becomes an established goal or an established expectation is much more likely to happen than something that was spoken of or decided in passing. Now, time to answer a question submitted by you. Today's question comes from Mary. Mary asks, can you explain the difference between healthy enabling and unhealthy enabling? Because there can be both. Mary, thank you for the question. This pertains primarily to last week's topic where I talked about financial enabling and how you can do harm when you think you're helping. And I think that's a good place to start. Healthy enabling, if you're helping someone, I'm not going to call it healthy enabling. I'm just going to say if you're helping someone financially, you're you're leading to genuine help. There's going to be positive fruits growing out of the help that you're providing and the boundaries are going to be well articulated and well understood between you and the person you're helping. When helping becomes harmful is when the financial assistance that you're giving is enabling unhealthy behavior or unhealthy patterns or an unhealthy dependence. So what you want to be looking for in telling the difference between these is self-destructive behavior or a pattern of behavior that you don't believe is genuinely healthy for the person you're helping. I'll refer back to the story as an example. If I didn't establish firm boundaries with my brother on the carpooling and I waited for him, well, I'm helping him, right? I'm giving him a ride. There's a financial assistance there indirectly, but I'm helping give him a ride. If I don't establish boundaries and I help him with the ride day after day and he doesn't respect the time that I have to leave and he comes later and later and later, Well, now I'm enabling him to be irresponsible and be irresponsible not only with himself, but with my time as well and the help that I'm giving him. And there's some uncomfortable feelings that develop in the relationship when there's an unhealthy pattern like that. You can imagine if you're lending somebody money, you're helping them, and you start to do it over and over again, and you start to feel resentful of the help that you're doing because you see that the person you're helping is doing X, Y, Z with the money, even though they say they needed it for A, B, and C. Well, that might be a sign that there's an unhealthy pattern. Another thing to consider is, are you exposing yourself to undue risk by your financial helping of others? And by this, I mean, can you afford to actually help them? By giving financial assistance to the person that you love, are you making it so that you're in a tighter spot and can't make all of your needs? Are you in a position where you can't cover your four walls or can't make payments on your debts? That would be exposing yourself to undue risk and not putting your oxygen mask on before helping someone else. And that would be unhealthy financial enabling. I already mentioned it, but I want to reiterate, are the boundaries clear? Do you have an understood agreement as to what you're doing, what the limits are, when it's going to stop? Are you specific about it and why you're helping? Making sure that the reasons for the assistance are clear. For example, if you're giving money to someone to pay for their college career, but they're using that money to go pay for a car payment instead of their tuition, they wanted a really big truck. You gave them some money and they're using it to drive this awesome truck 
and they dropped out of school because, you know, they still can't afford it. They don't have the money to pay for tuition. Well, that would be unhealthy financial enabling. Lastly, I want you to consider, is independence the end goal of the financial help? If you consciously or subconsciously are looking to, through your financial helping of this person, of this family member or friend, through your financial help, are you looking to develop a dependence or are you trying to help your loved one find independence? And that can take some serious thinking to understand, but it's important because we want to make sure that help leads to healthy, sustainable independence. You can give someone a fish and feed them for a day or teach them to fish and feed them for the rest of their life. Are we teaching the people we're helping to fish as opposed to just giving them fish for a day again and again and again? Mary, thank you so much for your question today. I hope that helps. And if you have a question that you want answered on the podcast, Leave it in the comments below or go to the Hope Filled Financial Coaching website, hopefilledfinancial.com. Scroll to the bottom of any page. There you'll find a little form where you can send us a question and we'll answer it as a part of the show. Now, time for today's main topic. As mentioned before, for today's main topic, we're going to be reviewing an article written by NerdWallet. Now, NerdWallet is not a sponsor of the podcast, but as you can see by the title of this article, it definitely fit with today's theme. This article is called Family Loans, How to Borrow From and Lend to Family. Family loans can provide a cheaper leg up, but they also risk the relationship. Carefully weigh the pros and cons. So not only do I want to read through this article and share it with you, but I want to provide my own insights to the trade-offs that exist within the decisions or the examples that they have in the article about lending or borrowing from family. So as we get started here, the article begins by saying, borrowing from family may seem like a low-cost option if you need money for a down payment on a home to start a business or repay high-interest debts. But mixing money and family is tricky. A family loan can put your relationship with the lender and their finances at risk. Success requires clear communication and maybe even a written agreement that details the loan terms. Family lenders must also consider IRS guidelines. Now, the IRS guidelines are something that you should very seriously consider. There's always a question of, was this a loan or was this a gift? The IRS is going to treat them differently. I'm sure the article is going to dig into it. The other thing is, when you loan money, the, the Fed dictates a minimum interest rate that must be charged. And if the family loan is a interest-free loan and it's substantial, you might be getting yourself into some serious tax trouble and legal trouble at that. And as a quick disclaimer, what I say on this podcast here and what they say in this article does not substantiate IRS tax advice or legal advice. The article continues, here's what to know about getting a personal loan from a family member, including the pros and cons and how to formalize a family loan and alternatives to consider. So what is a family loan? A family loan is a loan between family members. You don't say. But it's up to you and the lender to decide how it is structured. A family loan can have interest, or not, be repaid in installments, or a lump sum. And you can even provide collateral. This type of loan can be informal or formalized with a loan agreement. It sounds good and flexible at this point, right? Family loans can help you quickly bridge an income gap or cover an unexpected expense. They can help you avoid expense, no credit check loans, and don't have many barriers to approval. But the potential downsides include tax implications and a bit of awkwardness. Could be more than just awkwardness that you run into depending on the situation. The article continues with the following pros. There are four pros. The first pro is easy approval. The second one is cheap loans. The third is hardship options. And the fourth is help avoiding risky loans. So let's go through each one in depth. Easy approval is the first one. There's typically no formal application process, credit check, or verification of income when you're borrowing from family. Traditional lenders often require documents such as W-2 pay stubs and tax forms as a part of the loan application. Now, if you're not going to be able to go to another lender 
to a bank and qualify for a personal loan of equal size to what you're borrowing from family, there's probably a reason for that. If you have poor credit and someone else isn't willing to give you the money, well, you are probably a high risk borrower. And by borrowing from family, you're putting the situation, the deal, the relationship at higher risk. Back to the article, pro number two, cheap loans. Since the loan is coming from a family member instead of a for-profit corporation, you may get a loan at a much lower interest rate than what the bank, credit union, or online lender might offer. Family members are also unlikely to charge late fees or upfront origination fees that lenders sometimes charge. Sure, while this may be a benefit, there's also the flip side. What if the family member had an expectation that you would abide by a verbal agreement or a fairly informal agreement, and if you didn't, they expected you to pay them more interest or a fee or something like that, and it wasn't spoken. It wasn't detailed out. That kind of situation does happen. So while they're less likely to do that to you, if they decide to, well, that's going to be pretty harmful to the relationship. At least it would be if someone did that to me. I wouldn't be very happy with them. Jumping back into pro number three, hardship options. Family members may be more lenient than other lenders if you encounter a hardship, like a job loss or illness, letting you pause or suspend payments for a period of time. So I think what they're saying here is if you fall on hard times, you lose your job or you become so ill that you can't work, well, family members are probably going to be a little bit more emotionally invested in you as a person than a lender who sees you as a faceless number. So a family member is more likely to say, you know, it's okay, you don't have to pay me back now, I understand you're going through a hard time, we'll take care of this when you get back up on your feet. But you need to remember, what you have done now is you've put yourself in a situation where you feel like you can't pay your family member back, because you can't. You you really can't. Just like you couldn't with another lender. And depending on how long your hardship is going to last, well, that's going to perpetuate the situation where you are beholden to your family member who lent you the money. The Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender, and that is still true when you're borrowing from family. When you are visiting with this family member who lent you the money, even though you're on hard times and they're understanding, you're going to feel less independent. You're going to feel a little weird about the fact that you owe them money, and you're going to feel judged by them. You're going to feel like they're watching you. They may very well see you doing something with money that they don't approve of, and they're like, well, they owe me money. Why are they doing this when they owe me money? They could have paid me back. And they may not say it, but they think it. And just thinking that kind of stuff sows division in the relationship, no matter how close it was before. Hopefully they mention that in the cons here. They list three cons. Number one is the potential for conflict. The second one, tax implications. And the third one, there's no credit building. The first one's the big one for me. Potential for conflict. If the loan isn't repaid or the terms of the agreement are broken, it can lead to arguments and strain in a family relationship. The family member loaning the money must consider the chances of not getting the money back and whether the loan will impact their own financial goals, such as retirement. So if you're the one who's in a healthy financial situation, you have members of your family who are asking you for the money. You're trying to decide, do I help them or not? Is this going to lead to a financially enabling situation that's harmful for them, or is this something that can genuinely help them? If that's you, if that's your situation, the advice I would have for you if you feel so compelled to give this financial help is to to only give what you can afford to not ever receive back. And when you loan that money, loan it with the understanding you may never see it again. Because the person who's borrowing it from you may be like, well, they're well off, they don't need it. And I'm having a hardship and we're family, they should understand. And they may end up treating it more like a gift. And you don't want to go after them trying to collect it and harm the relationship. You may not ever lend them money again because you know that they're not good for it. But only lend money that you're willing to never see again. That should at least in part help your relationship with someone who borrows from you and never pays it back. Now that doesn't necessarily make it right, but I think it's a good guideline to help guard your heart against harming the relationship or feeling that you broke the relationship by lending the money. And they mention in different terms here that it's unhealthy for you to be lending money to a family member if it exposes you to undue risk, if it's an imprudent decision for you. They basically say, are you harming your financial future by lending that family member money? If so, 
that's probably bad because now when you can't make that financial goal, when you're hindered in your financial future, you're going to hold it against that family member, either directly or indirectly, either in your mind or in your heart. And you deserve a better relationship with your family members than that. Jumping back to the second con in the article, tax implications. If the family loan is interest-free and over $17,000 as of the writing of this article, the family member who loaned the money may need to file a gift tax return. If the loan includes interest, the lender must follow IRS interest rate guidelines and potentially report it as income. Now that just sounds like a really messy complication when it comes to filing taxes, doesn't it? Even if I wanted to help a family member, I would feel compelled to avoid this undue burden and complication for filing taxes. And it also raises an interesting question. They mentioned it in in the article there, both gift tax as well as income and interest. So is it going to be classified as a gift? And is it going to be taxed at the gift tax rate? Or is it going to be taxed as a loan? And when you get the payment back with interest, that's going to be classified as income for the family member who lent the money. Well, either way, it's going to be important to have a written record in this situation of what it was. Was it a gift or was it a loan? Because as mentioned before, a loan that's never paid back may very well look like a gift. And if it wasn't determined in an agreement that was written, well, it's a my word against their word situation. And I don't want to be in a place where I have to go back and forth with family like that. And to a much lesser extent, that's why I wrote a written agreement for carpooling with my brother. Okay, the article's last con for lending money to family. Number three, no credit building. Payments toward a family loan aren't reported to the credit bureaus, eliminating the opportunity to improve the borrower's credit. Good credit scores can help you qualify for credit in the future, like a mortgage or a car loan. If you haven't heard me mention it on the podcast before, a credit score is a number that lenders are using to see how likely it is that you're going to pay them back. It's a number that indicates to the lender how safe a bet you are for them to give you money so they can make money. And if you want a credit score that's good, well, that's just so that you can borrow more debt. It's an endless cycle. You borrow money so you can build a credit score, so you can borrow more money, so you can build a credit score. So you can borrow more money. And it just goes round and round and round. Well, why do we need to borrow money? American society tells us that stuff is going to make us happy. That being a good consumer is going to support the economy and help us improve our pursuit of happiness. But we know that we cannot buy happiness. We know that there's more to life than the material. So if we are just trying to buy our happiness, we're basically seeking an endless trail of temporary joy that can only be topped by spending more and more and more. And if we are outspending our income, we're spending beyond our means. The only way to do that is to borrow more and more and more. We live in a society that says instant gratification is the way. For goodness sakes, what would be the purpose of a credit card if it wasn't to go and buy something that you want now with money that you don't have? What would be the purpose of having a high credit limit? that is super easy to access, that you can use to buy everything from a barbecue grill to a cheeseburger at McDonald's. Back to the article, how to make a family loan agreement. Okay, so they're getting into the nitty gritty of what to do if you decide to continue borrowing or lending to family. Use a family loan agreement to avoid issues that may arise during the repayment period. This is a contract that spells out the terms and conditions of the loan. Basically, write down your boundaries and expectations in advance and stick to them. Having a notarized, oh wow, they're going all the way. Having a notarized and signed agreement with a family member may seem impersonal, but having things in writing can prevent misunderstandings and frustrations. Be sure to include both parties in the decision-making process. I tell you what, if you got a long-term agreement, everybody's going to remember it differently if it's not written down. Here's what to include in your family loan agreement. The amount borrowed and how it will be used. Repayment terms, including the payment amounts, frequency, and when the loan will be repaid in full. The loan's interest rate. The IRS sets an applicable federal rate each month. 
which is the minimum interest rate allowed for private loans over $10,000. So keep that in mind. If you ever lend more than $10,000 as of the writing of this article, you're going to be subject to a minimum interest rate that you must charge or be being charged by the IRS. If the loan can be repaid early without penalty, and how much interest will be saved by an early repayment? Lastly, what happens if the borrower stops paying, whether it's temporarily due to an emergency or entirely? A tip to make things easier on the lender, have an idea of how much you need to borrow, what it's for, and when you plan to repay the loan when you approach them about borrowing. One thing that it doesn't mention here, by making a written plan and putting it all on paper, you're also introducing friction to doing the deal. And this can be very healthy for both the borrower and the lender in the family situation. If you're the lender, you know that only someone who's very serious about paying you back is probably going to go through the due diligence of filling out this paperwork and actually signing it. And you know that they're not going to try to turn around and change the order of the deals either on purpose or on accident. Continuing with the article, it lists some alternatives to family loans. When weighing the pros and cons of a family loan, consider alternative options that may provide more cash and less risk to family relationships, as harming your relationship is indeed the greatest risk when dealing with money in the family. Alternative number one, personal loans. You can borrow a personal loan from a bank, credit union, or lender. You get a lump sum of money and repay it in monthly installments over a period of two to seven years. Personal loans can be used for nearly any purpose, including consolidating debt or home improvements. Personal loan rates range from 6% to 36%, with the lowest interest rates reserved for borrowers with good to excellent credit, a score of 690 or higher. Some lenders, like online lenders and credit unions, offer loans to borrowers with low credit scores. Bad credit loans can have rates at the high end of the lender's APR range, but they're much more affordable than payday or other non-credit check loans. Yeah, I'd never consider a payday loan under any circumstances. I covered payday loans and the financial trap that they are in episode 30. Let's see if there are any other alternatives here. Ooh, next one is co-signing personal loans. Some lenders allow you to add a family member as a co-signer to a loan application. Doing so can increase your chances of qualifying, but put less pressure on the family member since they are not providing the cash. However, there's still a risk of damaging the relationship. Failure to repay a co-signed loan can hurt both of your credit scores. A co-signer must repay the loan if the borrower cannot. And that is why you never, ever, ever co-sign a loan for anybody. If they don't pay the loan back, you're on the hook for it. And if you don't pay it, well, both your credit scores do tank. And having a bad credit score is significantly worse than having no credit score. When you do this, when you co-sign a loan, you're introducing a great deal of risk into the relationship. If you need someone to co-sign on a loan for you to qualify, that means that you're not in a financial situation where you can service the loan yourself, according to the lender. That means more than likely, if you go and you co-sign a loan, you're going to be doing so for someone who probably won't be able to make all the payments back. A good example would be a student loan. A student doesn't have a guarantee of a job or an income after they graduate, but they do have a guarantee of taking out a lot of debt. You as the parent do have an income. So when you go in and you co-sign on their loan, you're taking the responsibility of their debt to get that education and reducing the risk to the lender enough that they're willing to shell the money out, knowing that you may very well likely be the one who pays it back. The next alternative they list is cash advance apps. Cash advance apps let you borrow up to a few hundred dollars and repay money on your next payday. These apps don't charge interest, but they may charge subscription fees and fast funding fees, and they often ask for an optional tip. If you use an app, make a plan to pay the advance back on time. Just like payday loans, I can never recommend these. The way that these apps charge you money in the end ends up costing you a massive percentage of what you're borrowing. The equivalent APR is actually comparable to payday loans. 
I don't like these things at all. They're basically payday loans in your pocket that you have instant access to, bo- boasting interest-free borrowing, while they profit on the fact that you're probably not running a monthly budget. Okay, next, buy now, pay later. A buy now, pay later loan is an at-checkout financing option that splits the bill from one shopping trip into multiple, usually four, smaller payments. These payment plans are available at major retailers and are the best for large purchases, like a new mattress or a laptop. Use one payment plan at a time to avoid overspending or losing track of payment due dates. And I think I've covered the buy now, pay later stuff before, and if I haven't, I've written it into a workshop. But buy now, pay later loans increase the average spending at the retail outlet by 40%. These things are basically a repackaging of the psychology of a credit card and getting you to buy something now that you don't necessarily need. These things are used for once. Let's be real. You can go and use a buy now, pay later loan at the store to buy anything. And there's a reason why they have that caveat. Only use one at a time so you don't lose track of things. It is very likely that if you have a couple of these things running or more, you're going to lose track of it. Statistically, you're going to lose track of your due dates for your buy now, pay laters. And if, if you have a whole bunch of them, they're going to charge you fees for them when you miss those due dates. They're going to make a lot of money on you. What would I recommend instead? Save up for the large purchase. Don't borrow the money for something. Have some patience. Make a plan. Make a sinking fund. Save up for it. You might have to wait a little bit before you buy it, but you're at least going to be able to do it in cash in a way that poses no risk to you, let alone risk to a family member whom you may borrow money for to go buy this one. Okay, and the last one is gifting. When family members agree that a loan doesn't need to be repaid, it's considered a gift. This may be a choice when there's a concern that a loan might put the relationship at risk and if the family member can afford to make the loan. And I have no problem with giving someone money as long as it doesn't lead to financial enabling as mentioned in last week's episode. And that's it. That's the entirety of the article. And my ultimate advice to you is to avoid dealing with loans within family either as the lender or the borrower. It just makes everything much messier. And the situation can probably be taken care of with a little bit more time and patience and financial responsibility for either party. And if you're the person who's wanting to lend the money to a family member in need, I would consider the alternative of giving the money. And if you're wanting to teach that family member how to be a fisherman as opposed to giving them a fish so that they can do better with money in the future... Consider making your gift contingent on doing something like getting a financial coach or having a written budget or give them half the money now and the other half of the money later when they are able to demonstrate some sort of responsibility or exercise, healthy exercise in personal finance that you think is going to most help them. And if they're not willing to do the work in order to receive that gift from you, well, then you know that you just avoided a situation where you're probably going to slip into poor boundaries and financial enabling that was going to be more harmful to both of you and your relationship. And I think that's going to wrap up the podcast today. If you liked today's episode, be sure to like it, follow it, subscribe to it, whatever it is on the platform that you use to listen to the Hope Filled Financial Podcast, whatever can help us grow in following and help us reach more people with healthy, hope filled financial wisdom. Until next week, until next Tuesday, budget bravely and enjoy your hope-filled financial future. 